one like uh, Q and A uh, question and answers. Okay, so we start at so three thirty, uh, and we go probably to uh, forty minutes, then two minutes Q and A. So we all stop at thirty minutes and twenty minutes Q and A. Yeah, that sounds fine. It depends. Yeah, uh, I like. think so. Uh, that's so that what you, I prepared. So that we, we end at for at. Uh, 16.20. Okay. So 16.10, I'm going to show you, or I will show you like 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, 16.10. And it will be 16.10, six, mm -hmm. so that you know that 10 more minutes and... Yeah, okay. And it's like a start of q and a if, mm -hmm. Oh, it depends. Okay. okay. Then I assume that you don't need me sitting anywhere else, you don't need right there, and if there's any questions... Yeah. I think so. You don't need to be here. Uh, I will speak I'm, frankly. I'm not here neither. Is, so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, not really. This is more about Jenkins on OpenShift, but we are Phil Henry. We are just. Phil uh, Henry itself, I don't know, like we have guys from Phil Henry sitting here. But I won't be talking about Feed Henry at all. Uh, be, because because I, I will explain because there will be a lot of like simplifications. Feed Henry is really big. Uh, yeah, tomorrow will there will be. Uh, look for Wei Li. He will be presenting about microservices again, and he might have more Feed Henry stuff. Or if, if you meet him and look at the main tag and see Wei Li, that might be about how we are using CI Okay, so if I may start and introduce myself. So my talk should be the story of continuous integration in Red Hat Mobile. I'm one of the two elites in our Red Hat Mobile team. And, well, it's an ongoing story. We don't really have continuous integration yet, but we are building stuff and this thing will be more on the technical, maybe demo showing side because we want to share this uh, with you. And it's basically a thinly veiled advertisement for Jenkins on OpenShift because that's what we are planning to use and what we are prototyping. So first I will go through a few slides where I will describe the situation. And we'll talk about things there. I will do a lot of simplification. So I will pretend that we only run things in OpenShift. In reality, we have like large SAS, Chef, orchestrated deployments, but I don't think you would care that much if I spent 20 minutes talking about that. I might, uh, you, you might assume that I'm talking about stuff that actually really works. It doesn't work that well, but you should be able to run it because we have a lot of these configurations in public on our public GitHub. Uh, I will kind of assume that all of our repositories are open source, even though we do a lot of our uh, development behind closed doors. This is slowly changing, but those repositories I will show you are, of course, already open. Uh, of course, I will try not to show you any AWS secrets or something like that. And I will pretend that currently we have like single service we are concerned about because talking about those, the, that migrating like from monolith to microservices thing that John talked about in his presentation, we would be over here just to explain the mess we are in. And John maybe in his talk two hours ago kind of talked about that and I don't want to talk about that. So, I have this little service, it's called OKGEM Bus, and it's, let's call it a stand-in for our product. 
because it's a nice little service. Well, actually, it's a nice little single endpoint, and uh, behind it there are four microservices running in OpenShift, and it provides kind of a backend to our drag and drop mobile questionnaire zero code kind of application. Even here I'm lying, but. This is how the questionnaire application looks like. For example, you would submit something, save, uh, then somebody else could download CSV or PDF or something like that. And this is how the embossed service would look like deployed in OpenShift. Uh, you see like those four services. The last thing, the fifth one, is just the MongoDB. So this more or less is the first thing that really is our true microservice. And that's why this is what we are looking on in our tooling team when we want to then develop the whole CICD pipelines <coughs> around that. So how do we currently build our stuff? We have unit tests triggered on PR and this, is, uh, this PR build usually in the end create some sort of deployable artifact, most often Docker image, and we have kind of semi-automatic configuration management, more or less like this, like in the end there is the Docker image and we have service template, that's actually the config file you throw at OpenShift and it does the deployment stuff. So that's first thing, and in the end you need to merge the pull request so that you have the service template that you then deploy with OpenShift and then maybe another main, more or less manual separate thing. You would run an integration test when you want to make a release of this mock service. Uh, in reality, of course, we have like three different repositories because each service has its own like build path, etc. And in the end, this is how it looks like. We would have like three different images referenced in the service template. OpenShift downloads these images, and then we would have the running embass. And as you can hear me, I'm talking a lot of about stuff you do manually. And this pull request build is nice, but we can do better, and we want to do better on Jenkins 2.0 on OpenShift. And we have like three really pragmatic reasons why we want to do the upgrade. First is we currently have this pull request built on Jenkins 1.0 on ordinary like AWS node running somewhere, but Jenkins 1.0 is no longer updated really. And we are really heavily invested in OpenShift, so it makes sense to use more OpenShift to do stuff we want to do with our platform. And we think this might enable us to have the proper CI pipeline where there wouldn't be like four manual steps in between these different builds. So do I need to cover what OpenShift is? Any Anybody who wasn't on four talks already. Uh, one thing I maybe want to emphasize that really nice thing about OpenShift is that it adds building <coughs> capabilities. And I think tomorrow there is a whole workshop about using OpenShift builds. And this is some of the stuff we are using from that toolbox. So OpenShift builds are really cool because what I showed you previously like here, you can see we have like three static images that we needed to produce and upload some, to some Docker Hub or something. But OpenShift, in theory, can just pull your repo, build everything, and then deploy the new thing without the middleman, without Docker Hub interfering, without you needing to upload something. So that's a cool thing about it. Uh, you can use Docker files, you can use source to image, 
you can have all of this like directly in the giant YAML you will throw at OpenShift. You can have this sourced from Git repo somewhere. So quickly, what do we have actually so far? We have figured out, I think, really nice way how to do the Jenkins configuration. And we kind of have a prototype for our release pipeline and we have some plans for con OpenShift continuous integration. So I will be talking about how we actually do the Jenkins uh, config. And I might actually do a little demo here because <coughs> when I actually have the config here, I might actually do that. So let's create new project that will be just CI. Will this work? Awesome. And let's create new application that will be basically all of our CI. Currently our plan is that in the end the whole deployment of our CI infrastructure would look like this because the OpenShift templates are quite sophisticated and can host quite a lot of information. So I will just create this new template. Oh, hmm. What did I forget? Uh, oh well. Fortunately, I can cheat even more and I already have one prepared because then I would be sad and I would be debugging here. So, uh, what I mean by a lot of information that you can store in the config is that we don't have just the running application, that's just a single Jenkins, we actually use build configs. And currently we use two kinds of build configs, one build config for specifying things about Jenkins like plugins, etc. And second set of build configs uh, about our slaves where we can specify based on this repository what do we want to have on our Docker slaves? And this way, anytime you need to do any sort of update, it's really simple to just push into the Docker, uh, in, in push the new Docker file into the repo, and then you would click here on start build, and it would do a rebuild. And suddenly you would have a new slave with new configuration right when you start the new job. And I think that's really cool. So this is how we use the source to image. That's kind of a dry text, but it's still what OpenShift can really do for you that you just specify URI for your configuration and OpenShift takes care of the rest. Same idea for our slaves. Uh, what is nice is that actually you can really simply declare different slaves in the template just by supplying annotation and Jenkins when it gets built would know right away that all right I will use this docker image for our Java jobs. I will use other docker image for our Ruby jobs with this annotation. So I already showed you the slave update, you would just click the rebuild. So another thing that we currently rely really heavily on, our configuration is entirely in Jenkins job builder. And it's kind of this small Python project that can take unholy amount of YAML configuration, parse it, and spits out the XML that Jenkins needs to have its jobs configured. And 
we quite like it because it enables code reuse and everything is in Git repo and we can have PR reviews on our jobs updates and that's really nice because previously it would be just random colleague would clone a random job and nobody knows what is happening and where. Uh, another nice thing is portability, uh, which means that now when we are developing this new fancy Jenkins on OpenShift, we still have a lot of configuration from our old Jenkins and we can just port it over if we want. So I can show you, for example, here I have three jobs that actually are from the, our old Jenkins and this is running on the Jenkins CI that I have here running from OpenShift and if I want it I could do just hopefully maybe it won't work but fortunately it worked hour ago so This one, yeah, no, error, okay. Ah, that's pity. I should have left these three and one, one of these that I knew that worked. Uh, <coughs> okay, so basically you have to take my word that these three I created with this command that now fails for some unspecified reason. I could try to run it. Maybe that won't work as well. So let's try to build something. Pending. Okay. Okay. It creates <coughs> the slave pod. I think I should actually be able to see it here. Yeah, a few seconds. So when I run the job, it actually live creates a new pod, new slave. Everything is in clean environment based on the configuration I supplied like those two hours ago when I was rehearsing uh, with my <coughs> template. So I could now talk more about Jenkins jobs configs because I think they are really cool. This is like the simplest, smallest job you could create. It would produce something like this. If you ever had to manually edit Jenkins XML, you don't need to read this. Uh, this is more realistic Jenkins job. And you can start to see that it's quite complex configuration even though we like it that it's a configuration and not clicking in GUI. Uh, it even has some templating capabilities, which we like, but it can get weird where sometimes you think you have a template and then when you try to use it, you forget to pass in a parameter that you define in a template. And it doesn't give you reasonable error and that's the reason why we actually have a lot of problems with uh, Jenkins jobs. It actually is really hard to learn and even though we have this technology it still often happens that some of our colleagues will just copy paste Jenkins job in a GUI because it's so much simpler than trying to understand this weird templating YAML system and if it throws error it will just be exception somewhere in the depths of the Python executable and you know nothing what happened. And last but not least, uh, what I showed you, the quick command I, where I tried to update a job, it is actually quite simple to just overwrite somebody else's jobs because by default when you run this it updates all your jobs in your repository 
And last but not least, it's quite hard to install. We are solving this in two ways. Usually we either use a Jenkins job to update Jenkins jobs so that you don't have to run this Pythonic thing, uh, or we have Docker image that you would run instead that contains this thing. Okay, so I tried to show you this demo to for the config and it failed, so I afraid I can't really show you that. But I have from Jenkins at least. So uh, second thing we have considered really strongly is what if we just move the configuration to Jenkins file because that's a big new feature of Jenkins 2.0. It actually existed previously with some plugins, but now with Jenkins 2.0, it's front and center, and it makes most of jobs configurable with a Groovy script. And remember this weird YAML thing with Jenkins jobs? It would look like this. Much less lines, it's even kind of more readable, you know, roughly what happens. There are still some quirks like the properties list thing, but all in all, I would consider this to be much less readable and this to be much improved version over the YAML thing. Unfortunately, it looks like we won't be able to get rid of Jenkins jobs entirely because <laughs> you still need to configure somehow. How do we create our jobs? Maybe we will reconsider, but currently it looks like the solution will be that we will configure where the Jenkins files are from Jenkins jobs scripts. And so far it looks very well. There are one more thing to consider when trying to use uh, Jenkins files and this pipeline script. You might think it's a groovy and it, that it's the same programming language and you might be tempted to do things like hey I, ha I want to do on several nodes npm install so parallel for each label do npm install or something like this. Uh, unfortunately you can't uh, because the Groovy that runs inside of Jenkins is quite heavily hacked, uh, mostly to allow suspend and resume if you have a long running job and suddenly your Jenkins crashes. You want to be able to resume and repeat only the part of the pipeline that haven't run yet. So then you need to do things like this that you would have regular for and you would have temporary variable and you would iterate beforehand and, <coughs> oh, and all of this would happen like in first second of the job run so that when you actually call on Jenkins to start parallelly spawning all the nodes, it knows the config. And when it crashes, the hope is it would actually rerun only those builders that we created in this that haven't run yet or didn't finish yet. But still, it's something you need to keep in mind that you might think it's groovy, but it's not really. Oh, so I started talking about this a bit earlier. We still want to configure things with Jenkins jobs. And you actually can include pipelines in Jenkins jobs just fine. Or you don't, you don't, of course, need to supply the DSL inside. You can point it to a path in your Git repo you checked out. Uh, last thing we needed to figure out is that 
we really need to supply some secrets to our jobs sometimes for example some of our jobs provision stuff on AWS we don't want to have that public and we want to have that somewhat configurable as well as having access to private github repos or having access to private npm registries etc um, We have a workaround for this. One day when we will have enough time, maybe it will be like another Jenkins Jobs Builder plugin, because even though I don't like Jenkins Job Builder as much, it's really easy to extend. Currently, we have this literal Groovy file. Like, all right, XXX is not our AWS access key, of course, but you get the idea. And then we just throw this file with a post at Jenkins script URL and it can interpret it just fine and it will create what we need. Uh, it might be that in the end we will configure more and more uh, stuff that are auxiliary to jobs with groovy scripts like these. Currently, we use it mostly for AWS, GitHub, etc. So, uh, last but not least, what are we actually trying to do with this? As I showed you at the beginning, uh, currently we had sort of like the disjointed step where you still needed to merge pull request to your template config repo. And then you could maybe uh, throw it onto the OpenShift. And that leads to several problems because Sometimes it happens that our developers don't merge properly or don't rebase properly. So we realize that we need a proper pipeline. And so instead of triggering at every single pull request, we decided we will trigger at release and build all the components that have changed in previous release in parallel. Then we would collect the artifacts and update, oh, I forgot to change, not chef repo, uh, the template. So in this case, we would use Jenkins pipeline job, Groovy, some GitHub API to collect what has changed, what didn't, and uh, maybe our old build configs that we had in Jenkins job builder, and reuse them to do this massive rebuild. And it's still like proof of concept. That's why I don't even try to show you. But as you noticed, there isn't really OpenShift in this because why we don't really need to push OpenShift in everything. Uh, like there are a few <coughs> things that helped because we are using OpenShift, like triggering 15 builds at once is easier when you have this dynamic spawning uh, docker based slaves but you could actually do this without OpenShift Kubernetes plugin is completely standalone uh, there is then the other question currently uh, when we don't look at our POC, but the way we are currently doing the thing. You actually can update the service on every PR, which means uh, that anytime developer needs to deploy something, he wouldn't need to do a massive rebuild of everything. We still don't want our developers to go through just because they want to see if their update is running.
fortunately we can still use OpenShift builds for this which means that even though we still are building the uh, components the usual way with the Jenkins uh, currently even reusing the old configs verbatim we can create a new template that would just reference the component GitHub repo and it can actually self-host a Docker file that would build the component online in OpenShift and with this if developer would just want to try out do some integration testing or something like that he would just supply alongside the Giduri where is his branch and that would be it and he throws it at OpenShift and that's where the building happens and because OpenShift with Docker is quite good with caching previous stuff fortunately this can take quite a little time this is actually how I was currently developing those slaves and updates to those slaves I actually really just spin up this all of our proof of concept Jenkins things and then just pushed commit after commit little updates here and there rebuild, rebuild done in a second, rerun thing that I needed to integrate with. As you can hear, it's still not ideal, but it's better than the alternative we have now, I think. Uh, in future, we will probably move to something that would allow more local development, but this is currently the best thing we have for running something on OpenShift. So this is just quickly the build, small build pipeline inside of the OpenShift. So you have the template that actually can consume the, for example, embass PR branch that does the image build and then OpenShift can deploy the image. So there are still problems. We currently, even if our proof of concept, still don't have integration tests in the pipeline. And we are not yet sure how we would do that. So we are looking forward to the tomorrow's uh, workshop. And the second thing is, yes, currently, where we do our proof of concept, developer would really need to push into his own repo somewhere like every single line he wants to work with that's kind of suboptimal and we are still searching to some for some nice solution to this oh i went through these fast okay so in conclusion we think openshift build configs are really cool and that Jenkins pipelines are really cool and that docker-based slaves are really cool and the rest of it we kind of duct tape together with Jenkins job builder and groovy scripts and we are hoping to find maybe more elegant solutions oh speaking of duct tape uh, maybe I should show you how a real job builder conf, uh, like Jen Jenkins file can look like. So currently this is the proof of concept we have. It has like 200 lines and this 200 line behemoth represents what I had in a nice little graph in like three notes so we have still some way to go to have something where we actually would be comfortable at the end of this to try to trigger deploys and integration tests 
Okay, so I sped up throughout my 40 slides quite quickly. I thought I would stay at least a minute on each of them. But in that case, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for, to your questions. If you have no reason to run your stuff on OpenShift at all, there are not that many wins. Unless you really like the configuration aspect of this and you think that uh, you would be updating your Jenkins so often that, <coughs> yeah, I need to have CICD for my Jenkins, then OpenShift is a really good CD platform and it would help you. Uh, it doesn't hinder you in any way because even on OpenShift, it's still full Jenkins. You can load any plugins you want. You can hook, up, hook it up to any infrastructure you have besides your OpenShift, which means if you need to provision on You've seen that we are using AWS. We will have configuration for OpenStack as well. And we are planning to plug in Mac VMs to do our um, iOS testing. So it might not help you. Fortunately, it doesn't hinder you. So that would be the answer to this. Okay, more questions? Maybe I have another question. Um, in pipelines, you have uh, opportunity to define a manual step, so your pipeline can mm -hmm. stop and wait for user interaction. Do you see any, any value in that? Have you considered that? Have you found any use case where this would be appropriate? Uh, currently, we don't have such large pipelines in our proof of concepts where it would provide value. Uh, but once we get to the stage that we actually want to trigger integration tests or deploys, then there are always things that are hard to automate but really easy to check manually. And that's where this step would go, where it just pings you on email and tells you, hey, build finished. Do you really want to proceed? And you then click a button and say yes or no or something like that. Currently, we are glad that we have the beginning. And in the beginning, the deploy where I have the thing. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, okay. It's like this. Like you can see that we have this like separation that all right, this part has finished and we have the service template and then somebody else maybe deploys it and does the testing, etc. And right now what we solved is uh, this thing that it finally is not like three disjointed processes that often clash and requires care from the developer to merge correctly but this is suddenly in a pipeline of course next step that's logical is then draw 
like these two things are named almost the same, so they kind of fit together like two Lego pieces. So that's the next step to put them together. And this would be where your manual step would fit nicely, where it would ask you, do you really want to deploy? You, do you really want to run load tests, stress tests, integration tests, end to end, etc. Yeah. What's, what's the biggest piece of job tape you've had to use to solve our problem and ultimately how, how should we be solving that uh, Currently, I think the. Huh? Please repeat the question. Ah, the question was uh, that we are using a lot of duct tape in our proof of concepts. So, what is the largest piece that we duct tape together? Currently, it's the secret storage and secret configuration management. So if anybody has better idea than uh, throwing groovy files that for Jenkins to interpret, I'd like to hear it. Okay. Okay, so you are identity Security no. of oh. awesome. I will. And there is a lot of talk about and also Yes, that's that's happened with the today there's a bad problem. And my talk is tomorrow. Awesome, thank you. Currently, more or less yes. You need currently in this proof of concept, you need to have it in a pub, well, not publicly, but for the OpenShift accessible repository somewhere. Uh, but because the configuration is the same for everything, you just then run the new build template for your repo you have somewhere. So. Yeah, but yeah, if this happened because you had a pull request and that got triggered and deployed somewhere, then you would see it as a result of your pull request. But nothing would stop you to <coughs> run your own on the OpenShift we have. Well, if you have access to our OpenShift, that is. Uh, that's why I currently showed you just our more or less open source stuff, but it's something we're thinking about. Our current way of thinking is that we will probably, in the end, enable authentication with GitHub to our public infrastructure, but we have not decided on that yet. So in that case, if you really would be our contributor and we would add you to the right GitHub group, we would have no problem <coughs> with it for you to look at stuff. And we are currently investigating how to differentiate different users. Like, all right, do we want anonymous users to see results of builds? Probably yes. Like if it's somebody who just created pull request, we probably want them to see what is the build result. But maybe we don't want them to be anonymous. Maybe we want them at least to be logged into GitHub. Maybe we then want to differentiate be be between people that are contributors and people that actually work at Red Hat, <coughs> etc., etc. Currently, we are looking at integration with. GitHub as an auth provider because OpenShift provides this and Jenkins can uh, take the auth information from OpenShift and use it. How long does it take from commit to see the test result? 
you mean currently or you mean in, you mean in our proof of concepts? Uh, uh, it, concept, you know, yeah. Python, like there yeah. So how fast is our proof of concept? If you go from clean stage, it's terrible. It can take like 20 minutes. If you have at least something cached on OpenShift, it can get radically better, but it really depends what you changed. So we are still investigating how to optimize the build config itself and looking at probably changing the last thing that I showed you. You can see was this it? No. Did I forget to plug in to... Oh, I think my PC just died, so I can just tell you. Uh, so we actually currently in the proof of concept are using just the Docker build. And that's not optimal if you are building things from source. Source to image builds have a good caching strategy and we are investigating how to use them because those are consistently faster. Second, yes. Uh, in, in the case that I've used this for the development of the slave images where I used literally the same, uh, same process where when I update slave image, I need to update to git repo and that triggers rebuild. And good case scenario is literally the same as I would trigger Docker build which when cached can take like four or five seconds because if you add just the final layer to a Docker image, that's fast and OpenShift would do basically the same thing. So yeah, seconds. Okay. Any more questions? In that case, mm -hmm. okay. So because we have two more minutes, if anybody has last question, and if not, unfortunately, my PC died anyway, so. I wouldn't be able to show you things. So thank you very much.
Is it a live demo or a video? Why? Because you, because you have just uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> so you can do yeah, it fast. Don't worry. Don't worry. It will be fast. You have a lot of time even for travel shooting. Mm -hmm. Why do you need PDF? Uh, for the uploading the, to the need in the PDF the presentation, so you can okay. upload it to the second present the uh, sound. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> do you have a HTML or something like this on my I have on uh, my Google slide, but I don't want to share it. So. Uh, you don't want to share it? No, 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 okay. this Google Slides stuff. Ah, okay. Um, um, Yeah. Uh, uh, you can join us tonight. Uh, 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 it's a web service. Which means 